Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Dean Keppen. It is such a pleasure to work with the team here at Quinnipiac Center for Medicine, Nursing, and, and Health Sciences. Uh, this is our fourth forum, and uh, we have had just such a wonderful experience developing a relationship with Quinnipiac, and uh, I really appreciate it and thank you for it. Um, welcome to today's forum. Welcome to everyone here. We are so excited. Um, this forum, Getting to Better Health, Connecting Care and Community, is really going to um, provoke our thinking and challenge us to figure out how we get further along the line in uh, making that connection. Thank you all for coming today. We've got such a great diversity of uh, people in the audience that I, I want to take a moment to describe the audience. We have many people who've committed their lives to um, public health. We have a few doctors and other healthcare professionals, um, including a number of hospital leaders and several community health centers, and certainly many from the Quinnipiac community. Uh, we have a cadre of advocates and community organizers who work to ensure that the voices of patients and consumers are heard. Uh, a good number of um, people uh, dedicated to improving the quality of care in, uh, in, in health care. Uh, several state and local officials. Some community-based organizations and enterprises working on the social and economic determinants of health, and many colleagues from the uh, field of philanthropy in Connecticut and beyond. So welcome. We're really looking forward to your questions and to the discussion after we hear our speakers. Today's forum, of course, would not be possible without the support of our partners and our, and our uh, event sponsors, so a thanks from the heart to our friends at the um, at Healthy CT, Connecticut's nonprofit uh, health insurance co-op, a very exciting venture. Uh, to our friends at the Community Foundation for Greater New Haven, thank you very much. You've been friends and partners for a long time. And certainly to our friends at the Donahue Foundation. And our media partner, uh, Connecticut Health Investigative Team, who's been with us since the very beginning of the series. And of course, to our patrons. Um, as Dean Keppen said, this is the fourth forum in the Reform to Transform series. The themes of our series have really focused on the triple aim, which is the lens through which we look at what it takes to transform healthcare. Reducing cost, improving care and the ex patient's experience of care, and improving population health, which is the subject of today's forum. One of the forums we hosted focused on um, how to engage the public, consumers, and patients in achieving change. This summer, we will announce a pilot health advocacy leadership initiative um, designed to build uh, the scale and capacity of Connecticut residents um, to be able to achieve change in health and health care. In October, we will connect the dots between all of the different programs and begin a statewide conversation on what's next for Connecticut. We will uh, be sending a save the date in the near future, so please be on the lookout for that. The mission of CHART and the Universal Healthcare Foundation is to be a catalyst that engages people and communities in shaping a, dem a democratic health system that provides universal access to quality and affordable health care and promotes health in Connecticut. We believe that health care um, is part of a larger social and economic justice context. So it's only fitting that today we focus on what it means to improve the health of the population. In keeping with the aims of the Reform to Transform series, today's speakers will help us develop a shared understanding of the key challenges we face to achieving improved health and better balance between prevention, public health, and the medical model of care. We also will hear about and discuss on the ground work right here in Connecticut and Vermont that focuses on solutions and that builds and fortifies our collective resolve to take action. Before we start, for those of you using social media, we are using the hashtag R2T and we encourage you strongly to tweet and post both during and after the events. 
The first part of our program today will be two keynote addresses. We're extremely pleased and honored to open our program hearing from Dr. Elizabeth Bradley, professor at the Yale School of Public Health and co-author of a very provocative book, The American Healthcare Paradox. She will be followed by Jenny Samuelson, assistant director of Vermont's ambitious and exciting blueprint for health. Once Betsy and Jenny um, have each had a chance to provoke our thinking and questions, the three of us will sit down for a chat and open it up for discussion um, from the audience. After a short break, you'll hear from some of our own Connecticut warriors working on this front in a panel discussion uh, moderated by Dr. Mehul Dalal, who's the Chronic Disease Director at the Connecticut Department of Public Health. So it is my great pleasure now to turn the podium over to Dr. Elizabeth Bradley. Thank you, Francis. That was such a nice introduction. I'm so honored to be here with the dean. Um, and I'm really tremendously honored just to be included in this kind of a discussion. Um, the United Healthcare Foundation of Connecticut what a foresight to put this really on the agenda and get us together in a way where we can really contemplate evidence and then start to have a good debate. So I would like to talk about this book. And first, I'd like to acknowledge many of the people who have facilitated the book that we wrote, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts Foundation, and of course, my co-author, who I often describe as someone who was once my student, then my colleague, and someday will be my boss. <laughs> You know how that feels. <laughs> so I think everybody has seen this chart. In fact, could I have a show of hands of how many people have seen this chart? It is, OK, yeah, I don't need to describe it. <laughs> so there the American flag is at the top, spending about 18% of our GDP on health care. The average high-income country in Western Europe, Scandinavia, our colleagues are spending on average about 10% of their GDP, 11% their GDP. And it is important to identify several critical benefits we have gotten from this enormous investment. For instance, people in the United States who have a kidney transplant are much more likely to live with less morbidity and live longer than if they had gotten a kidney transplant elsewhere in the world. We are good at kidney transplants. Knee replacements, if you need a knee replacement, this is the place to be. You'll get it faster, it'll be higher quality, and you'll have less morbidity after the knee replacement. MRIs, we have six times as many MRIs as many countries in uh, Western Europe. So if you need an MRI, the United States is the place to be. And it's important to acknowledge these because they, it's not that we've been spending money and getting nothing. We have been getting some amazing impact from the medical care that we have purchased. Our problem and our paradox is, how could we be spending all this money on medical care but not having good health outcomes? So if we look at some of the other health outcomes and compare ourselves, our maternal mortality rate of 34 OECD countries, the top being the best maternal mortality rates, we are 25th out of 34. We're six times that of Sweden, for instance. We're 26th in life expectancy. We're almost at the bottom and 28th in low birth weight. So these large, some people call them population health, but they're the health measures of our uh, group. is not really as strong as these others. And of course, if we step back and think, well, what determines health? Why could this be? We have to look back at decades of unequivocal evidence about what drives and prevents pre-early uh, 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 death. And in fact, genetics is maybe 20% of that piece of avoiding premature death. And healthcare is thought to be about 20% also. But the big bucket of things, as so many of you in the audience know, are really the social, environmental, and behavioral factors, of which people estimate, depending on the illness, 60 70% of the contributing factor is really this red bucket. And what's in the red bucket? that we have some control on from a policy or a provider standpoint. Well, what's in the red bucket, that is, things that are being spent, services being uh, financed that might deal with social and environmental and behavioral determinants, are things like employment programs, job training, supportive housing, rent subsidies, 
all kinds of nutritional programs, WIC, all the way up to Meals on Wheels for older adults, family assistance, and a whole host of social services that exclude health care, that exclude the benefits for health. And we thought, well, what would happen if we add together the spending on the medical side and the spending on all those other things, the social services, and instead of quantifying what are we spending on health care, why don't we quantify what we're spending on the entire encompassing group of that, both the health and the social services, and call it the total investment in health? And what if we look at that compared to all the other countries? Where are we? So this is a chart laid out the same way, um, but the blue bars are our percent of GDP spent on healthcare services, and the red bars are the percent of GDP spent on all those other social services that don't include healthcare. And we can see the United States is not a big spender anymore. We're just kind of in the middle. We're not anything very special. In fact, France is spending 36% of their GDP on the combination of this. We're spending about 29% of our GDP on the combination of this. And then if we look at it kind of a different way to say, well, if you're going to tax your population a certain amount, and then you need to make a policy decision of how much of that taxed money, that pooled money, will go into health care versus social service, and you put them in a ratio with social service on the top, and healthcare on the bottom. What does the United States look like then? Because we sort of think taxation is hard to change in a country. So given we're going, we've got our political, geopolitical methods, how are we allocating? And all of a sudden, our ratio looks dead last. In fact, if you had to repeat it, for in the United States, for every $1 spent on healthcare, 90 cents is spent on social services. But in the OECD, $1 spent on healthcare $2 is spent on social services. So in fact, it may be almost the same. Somewhere about 30% of your GDP is spent on these goodies that produce health, but the United States has chosen to allocate that in a certain way. And of course, the question is, because we know our politics and we know our economics, this may be what we want, but our question was, does it matter to health? Um, and in fact, this is just another way to see the same thing of, really what are the determinants of health and then what are the investments we're making. And you see sort of this mismatch. But as I said before, the question is, but does it matter? Maybe it's just what we like. Do we care? Does it matter to the health outcomes? And in fact, in our study of 10 years of data over all the OECD countries, countries with higher ratios of social to health care spending have statistically better health outcomes. And this is true for infant mortality, low birth weight, premature death, life expectancy, which are really the data that you can look at across countries in an equivalent way. Now, uh, some people have looked at this and said, well, that's just because the U.S. is in your data. So the U.S. is driving the whole thing. Take it out, and you won't find the same thing. But fortunately, a reviewer did ask us that in 2010 when we were actually getting this peer reviewed, and we removed the United States, and it's still true. So that's an interesting pattern, really. Um, so let's move on from there, because I think um, many of you have read about that, and many of you um, have maybe um, heard this already published or talked about. But what I'd like to turn us to today, um, to provoke more of a, OK, but what about us, uh, is say, well, what about in the United States? Um, are we going to find the same thing? Because our states give us an opportunity to look at variation in this. Our states are actually very different in their health care spending and in their social service spending, again, for lots of different reasons. So what I want to do is start with, well, what do we do nationally? And then I'd like to look at a few maps and sort of look at our variation across states, both in spending and in health outcomes, and see if we see similar patterns. Okay, so first, just to orient us a little bit to social services, um, because I think many of us who have studied healthcare, these data aren't something that we just have seen a million times. So what does it look like in the United States? Um, well, we are spending about uh, 13, it, it depends on the year, these are 2009, about 13, almost 14 percent of our GDP on a whole set of social services that we think are productive for health. 
And then you can see um, the first bar is total and then each of the different pieces, education, income support, transportation, public safety, environment. Oh my goodness, what is that small thing at the bottom? <laughs> oh, it's housing. Now, that's healthcare. It's an amazing investment strategy of the country. <laughs> we spend a lot on health care. And then just this, housing. And yet, if you had to look at the evidence, which we are now pawing through very carefully, about offsets, if I invest here, will I offset health care? The evidence is probably strongest in two places. One, housing. And the other actually is women and infants and children's uh, um, uh, uh, the support for nutrition, which falls in this chart in the income support. But the evidence behind housing is pretty good, actually supported by randomized trials much more than we typically have in many things that we support within the healthcare system. And you can imagine that it's just, you could double that and you'd hardly see a shift in other things. It's so small percentage wise. So it's just kind of an interesting pattern. But let's see if we look at the United States overall. So what we've done here, and I'll leave this up a while so you can find the state you were born in, the state you live in. Um, but this is a chart where the statistic we're looking at is the ratio of social service spending, all those buckets together, divided by healthcare spending. Now, the chart does not change much, much if you have total healthcare spending, but we have been asked to put in the healthcare dollar, just the public dollars. So it's Medicare and Medicaid are in the denominator. And that's sort of to look at the public spending on the social side and the public spending on the healthcare side. Um, and the green are where the social to healthcare spending is the highest. They're like the Swedish of us. <laughs> And the red is where social to healthcare spending is the lowest. And this is done in quintiles, so every 20%. And I think actually there are um, different, different ways to look at this. But one pattern one can see is on the West Coast, we really have got, in terms of this ratio, we have what we would expect to be the better health outcomes if our hypothesis is true. And in the upper e northeast where we are and in the south, less so. And again, it's a ratio. So remember, there are two pieces that go into this. You could get green because you spend a lot per capita in social services or that you spend a little per capita in healthcare. So you can get it either way. And we'll talk about that in a moment when we look at the health outcomes. So what I want to do is take this and put it on the left side. And then over here, I'd like to show another chart that is the percent of the population by state that is obese, just taking obesity as one indicator. And we've done this for eight different indicators that we could get good measures on across the country. Um, so the question is, what will that look like? So it's interesting. Um, there are a couple things. I think we're actually seeing three different investment strategies and health outcomes, buckets in the United States. One is on the left side, the Northwest, the West. Um, the, this is an area that really spends quite well on social services and has low health care costs. We all know that. It's nice weather out there. People exercise. You get, the, you know, psychologically a better place. When we look at days per thousand in the hospital, the West is always lower than the East. And, and that's really, I think, what's going on there. On the South, the South spends very little on social services per capita compared to other places, many of the states of the South, not all of them, and has relatively high health care spending. And their health outcomes reflect that. Uh, but it's really a, a, a low social service spending. The Northeast, I think we have a different, really a different place. We have actually, we're pretty generous where um, social spending goes. But our issue is we have enormously high health care spending. Um, and so I think that we are reasonable in our social services, but it's the ratio that um, it's not ideal. And the question, of course, would be of whether you could change that northeast. Right now, we look like we're sitting pretty. But we know Maine does suffer with this. And you know, would we want the entire northeast and um, throughout here to, to uh, 
would we change this chart at all, and would it be more uh, stable if we could actually change our spending patterns? So I guess the story from this is nothing is ever dropped at 100%. Here is the magic pill. Do it this way. Spend on housing, not health, not health care. But it starts to be kind of interesting that these patterns are emerging as a broad pattern. Then we wanted to take a look at this statistically, um, and this is under review right now, but I hope it will be published soon, is states, and so we did the exact same model, 10 years, all the spending, state by state, and it turns out in regression analysis that states with the higher ratios of social to health spending have statistically better health outcomes. And in fact, if you look at the bottom, we were much more able to adjust for everything you could imagine in this analysis rather than the international analysis, including the region that a state is in, you know, is it a southern uh, region, et cetera, the GDP of that state, and all the socioeconomic factors of that state, including their income, education, race, et cetera. And this is robust across a whole lot of outcomes, uh, lung cancer, asthma, obesity, limitations in daily activities, lower rates of mentally unhealthy days, and lower postnatal, uh, postneonatal mortality. So a lot of different outcomes, not just a few of them. It's really a pattern. I'd like to just take the last um, few minutes to move from what is the sort of science underlying this to the scary place of what to do, maybe just to provoke what Francis will grill us on later. Um, so what to do? What really are our options? Okay, so one option would be to spend more. Um, we're spending 28, 29 percent in 2009 of our GDP on these goodies that produce health. Well, should we move that up to 35 percent? Well, I don't think so. You know, we're just not in a political or economic environment where higher taxes or, um, are really going to get anybody elected or have anybody stay in their seat. So I, you know, it's hard to say, but I think it's a non-starter. Okay. The other is we could transfer money from healthcare, that big blue bar, into social services, into housing. So while community solutions would be really happy with that, there would be the largest industry in the globe that would be unhappy about that. And we have to understand our politics, and we have to understand our population. Our population has high avarice for health care and medical care. We have been built to be this way, and we have a system that does, in fact, re and probably because we want that as a population, it really uh, reinforces that. So this is a hard, hard thing to do, and I think it is actually fairly unlikely to literally rebudget and say, I'm going to take, I'm going to cut our health care spending to 16% of the GDP, and I'm going to increase my social care spending to, you know, 20% of the GDP. I think that is unlikely. But what else can be done? My own view of this is we can incentivize collaboration for health. And we've seen that. I can't wait to hear Jenny's talk on what Vermont has been able to do. We've seen it in small areas where the incentives are starting to be such that, in fact, investments with outcomes on health rather than just how much medical care or health care or even the quality of health care, but actually health, is becoming more of something that benefits the actual providers and the state itself and the taxpayer ultimately. Now, the evidence about integrative models, that is the healthcare sector reaching further out to try to coordinate with resources that are already there, rather than crowding them out, actually coordinating with them better, is starting to develop. And I think a lot this morning we'll hear more of people who are actually implementing these, but also from the peer-reviewed literature. Once you really start to put the stories together, there are several interventions that have good evidence behind them. I've tried to list some of them here. Various models of case management, the housing first model, various mobile clinics and community outreach efforts, um, nutrition support both for under women and infants and children and also the um, oldest adults. These are beginning to show real light at the end of the tunnel. So what could we do if we find little pockets or even whole states that are being successful in this sort of different way of thinking? How do we mobilize for collaboration for health nationally? So just a few ideas. First, 
I think we really have to mitigate our financial incentives to medicalize health. It is one thing to pay for health care, but it's another thing to stoke it, to really <laughs> fuel it, to put it in everybody's incentive to feed that avarice that our population has. And by the way, looking at this as a supply and demand problem is important. If we just look at it, those physicians are just ripping us off, that is just missing the situation. Because of course there's some of that, there is a supply issue. You pay for it, of course anybody's gonna give more. But there's the demand side. You and me, <laughs> my back hurts, I want an MRI now. So I think we have to look at both of these and think how do we mitigate the incentives to do this. Second, I think we need to establish common metrics for health and social services. I would love to see the dream from the academic. I would love to see the state or the community that decides here are our five indicators and we are all going to be incentivized to do them. Whether we're a housing agency or an employment training agency or a hospital, we have to work together to get these indicators and maybe those indicators would have some health ones, but maybe they'd be some of the other things that people care a lot about that we know transfer into health. It'd be nice if the social service, suddenly you'd see, ooh, the hospital's gonna put someone on the board of the job training center because they're getting a little bit of a incentive relative to percent employed, et cetera. I know, it's a little crazy, we can talk about it later. And last, I think um, we really need to talk differently all of us need to talk differently about health and health care, realizing that while in America generally we conflate these two concepts, they just are not the same. There is no evidence that these are the same. And the sooner we can understand that, the sooner we can be strategic. Aside from ideology, it's just strategic to invest in the most cost-effective portfolio of services to drive the American health. Thank you so much. What an act to follow. <laughs> so I'm incredibly privileged to be here today and especially privileged to follow Betsy um, in her presentation. And I'm going to walk you through our journey but um, that we've gone through in Vermont. <clears throat> But what I want to remind people is it always looks better and sounds better um, than, than, it re than it really is. But there are some great, there are some great, or at least the process. Um, the process, it's, it, it's looking back this seven years, there was a lot of pain that, went, that we went through to get there. So the components of the blueprint, um, I'm, I'm going to focus on certain components today. I'm specifically asked to focus on how we're integrating healthcare and human services, and that's through our community health teams and through our primary care practices. But I would be neglectful in not at least acknowledging the other components of the blueprint. So we have our advanced primary care practices or patient-centered medical homes in the state. Um, they are an integral component of our process, and I'll touch on those as we talk today. We've got our community health teams, which are interdisciplinary teams that are integrated both into the community and into the primary care practices. Um, we've got our community-based self-management programs. So in Vermont, the blueprint has invested in diabetes self-management, um, diabetes prevention programs, in-person tobacco cessation, um, the, and the chronic disease self-management program, and pain self-management program, and then also one for people with, um, who have um, persistent mental health illnesses. And they're a core part of our program. Um, we, in order to do the work that we've done, we have capitalized on multi-payer payment reforms. And I want to emphasize that they are multi-payer. So they're not coming from one payer. And I'll touch on what those payment reforms look like, but they're what has sustained the infrastructure um, that we have with our community health teams and our advanced primary care practices. We've invested in the health information technology infrastructure, which is right now really beginning to pay off in our evaluation and reporting systems, both from evaluating the outcomes of our program, which I'll show you a couple of slides on that, but also in looking at um, reporting back to practices and communities on their outcomes so that they can look at that and do quality and performance improvement um, based on measures and metrics rather than just guesses. And then we've also invested in our learning health system activities. And I think this is one of the things that I'm not going to touch on but stands out in Vermont. We've invested in practice facilitators and community facilitators to help support and project managers. That's different than some of our other um, other states that we've been partnering with who also have multi-payer interventions. But those investments at both 
um, putting uh, services out in the community to support the communities and the practices, but also putting um, resources into bringing those communities together to learn from each other has been an essential ingredient. Okay, so our advanced primary care practices. In Vermont, we actually asked them to do three things. We asked them to have a multidisciplinary quality improvement team that implements ongoing performance improvement. Often the first step of that is becoming recognized by NCQA as a patient-centered medical home. That gave us a common set of nationally recognized standards. We're a small state. We don't have the ability to um, promulgate standards as regularly as they need to, so we went with NCQA. We asked them to also integrate um, and participate in design and developing a community health team and put that into practice within their practice six months prior to their NCQA recognition and to participate in our information technology infrastructure so that instead of having a separate way of gathering information, we're gathering information at the point of care um, versus um, making that an additional burden. So what are our community health teams? This is what I've been asked to focus on today. Our community health teams are multidisciplinary teams, and they are designed locally through collaboration among the medical, health, and human services organizations. There's an important component to this statement, and that is that they are designed and developed locally. We made a very strategic decision in the state to allow the communities to assemble their, their um, individuals in their community to work together to identify what services existed and the gaps in those services and, and, and their health needs that they, that they had, um, looking at obesity and a, and a whole host of different measures, and then say, okay, how do we reorganize our current services to do things differently? And then beyond that, um, our community is going to receive funding directly from the insurers. It's 350000 for every 20,000 attributed patients to the patient-centered medical homes. We can, we can decide what are the professionals and the makeup of our team that are going to help support both the, the primary care practices to do better care and our communities to have better health. And so it was a, it was a local design process. They work both in the practices and, direct, and in the community. So there are a core group of staff who are care, nurse care coordinators, mental health providers who are actually embedded in the practices. Um, there are also asthma educators, um, health coaches, um, community health workers. Those work both in the practices and across the communities. They're generally a shared resource. They're functionally integrated into the practices six months before their NCQA recognition. And that was important because for those practices who are trying to do care differently, trying to do population management, their business design isn't set up so that they can actually have those functions built within the personnel. And so we asked them to integrate that in ahead of time. And that, was a bit, that actually made a big difference. They used those staff and knew how to use them almost immediately versus when they got them afterwards because we actually did both at one point. Um, the teams are scaled. Um, so in a community, there's, we have larger communities and smaller communities. Vermont is small. I'll acknowledge that. Our largest community is 100,000 people. Our smallest community, our, our total population in our state is a little over 600,000. So I always get, well, you know, Vermont's small. So I'll just put that right out there. Um, <laughs> Uh, the core resources are readily available to patients. There's no co-pays. Um, there's no asking why they're needed to. And our, and our community health teams form the glue. Um, Betsy talked earlier about the fact that we've got our health care system and we've got our social services system, and we needed a bridge between the two. And our community health teams, in designing, their, designing the community health teams themselves in that process, began to form that bridge. They began to say, okay, for, these co for both complex and other patients, we need to have connections to housing. We need to have connections to transportation. And so they make that, that bridge and that connection. Okay. This is a lot of the same information for those of you who are pictorial. This gives you some, some, some general information. But I want to point out that, that, there, that we have the community health teams. They are the connection between the advanced primary care, patient-centered medical homes, and the social services. And underneath them are the additional supports um, that are necessary. OK. The other thing that's different about Vermont is that we made we were very intentional from the beginning that this wasn't just going to be another complex care coordination program. There were a couple of intentional decisions. It was going to be local and it was going to be on the ground in local communities. So it wasn't going to be telephonic. We were actually, our insurers and their commitment to this were beginning to get rid of their telephonic disease management programs and investing in the community health teams. And we've begun to see that transition. The second thing is, is that it wasn't just going to be for our high, high utilizers. It was going to be for, from a population approach. So the proactive care across a panel. So 
are they, they're identifying individuals who may be overweight in a practice. They're identifying individuals across a panel in a practice. It began to bring the public health concepts into the primary care practices. Um, who hasn't had immunizations? And they're calling them back in and doing proactive care, both if people are out of care and or when they're coming in for care, they're, they're doing more proactive care at that, at, that, at that time. They're establishing new connections with community services. We began to say, okay, if you identify someone in your primary care practice that doesn't have housing, we know that that's going to impact their, their overall health and their health outcomes, so let's get them connected to a housing provider. Um, new services that were provided that aren't typically covered. So in Vermont, and I, I think it's mostly across the country, things like nutrition support services and, and, and coaching are not provided to people who are overweight. We wait until they have diabetes. We wait until they're, they're further in their disease process. So we said we're going to allow people to come in when they need it and the services are, the services are gonna be available. We're also shifting to address some of the social determinants of health. So the community health teams commonly will say some of the things that they do most often are housing, um, working with people on nutrition competency and also food insufficiency, transportation, and physical activity. And <laughs> we, all, we allowed the, the practices not to identify people just through data, but from their hunches. They know who the, the folks who are gonna come, who are gonna have health crises in the future. We're not waiting for that. So we allowed the clinicians to do it rather than just doing data. I know it's a common thing to say, okay, what about their emergency room visits and other things? And we, we decided to look upstream from that. It's a very conscious decision. So our community health teams didn't replace um, our specialized services. They actually became a bridge. So our, our advanced primary care practices do health maintenance, prevention, um, and other types of um, preventative care. Our community health teams provide additional support for that and keep a bridge to specialized services. But what I want to make sure is inherent in our conversation today is we didn't get rid of those specialized services. We didn't get rid of our designated mental health agencies. Those services were really important in our community. We just created a, a step in the continuum of care. I always get asked, so what are your community health teams? If you allowed the communities to design a development, aren't, aren't they all radically different? They actually had a lot of common commonalities and similarities. Communities often develop nurse care coordination and mental health with, within infrastructure within their communities. And then here are the, here's kind of the breakdown statewide. Um, so there was more similarities and differences even though we allowed the communities to design it. But what we did see was that the way that they implemented it looked slightly different based on their infrastructure and their community. I also get the question, well, if it's funded by all of the insurers, your community health team is funded by equal shares from all of the insurers, aren't your, your highest need, like your, like your Medicare and Medicaid, um, using the community health team more? And actually, it's not. This is newer data. This is pulled out of our um, contacts with our community health teams. And 32% are commercial, um, about 24 are Medicaid, and um, 47 Medicare. So it's being used across the spectrum. And this kind of loosely goes along with what the populations actually look like in Vermont. We have about 40% um, um, commercial. So, okay, so how is it funded is always the question. <laughs> Sounds good, but how do we fund it? Well, I, I will acknowledge that we had a lot of both governatorial support, um, even in the transition of governors from, from a um, Republican to Democrat, and in our legislature. And one of the things that they did, and from our insurers, our insurers were the ones who actually convened first and said we need to do something differently, and then they all kind of came to consensus, and then our legislature backed us up when the third one was about ready, which is a national insurer, about ready to back out. So. Our payments are twofold. Currently, and I'm going to share if we have time. I know I'm going to run close on time, but we have twofold um, payments. One is a payment directly to the practices, um, a PM PM, and this is based on the attribution of the insurers to the practices, and it comes directly from insurer to the practice. It it's small comparatively. It's about two, it's a little over two dollars on average. Um, but it, 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 it does bring the practices into the process. The second thing um, is the shared cost for the community health team. So each of the insurers contributes a share um, based on their population of patients to the to local community health team. And again, the state never touches the funding. That was also part of the design. It goes directly from the insurers to the community and to an entity that the community decided would be the best entity to administer their community health team. Okay. So what are some of the outcomes? I think this is gonna to begin to tie 
um, to tie my com my presentation together with Betsy's presentation, and that is is that. I, and I've divided this out by commercial and Medicaid for a specific reason. But when you combine commercial Medicaid and Medicare, we are seeing that the lines are pretty much the same. And these are in our annual report with more discussion. So if you want to dig in deeper, you can go there. Um, but essentially what we're seeing is, is for the, when we compare practices, now 80% of Vermont practice, primary care practices, more than that are involved in the blueprint. But when we compare practices and their outcomes for their patients who are involved in the blueprint compared to others who are involved in out-of-state practices or other Vermont practices, we actually have seen a statistically significant drop over time in healthcare costs. We've cut this other ways. We've looked at what if during the intervention and the post-intervention period, and it still holds. Um, so the same thing holds for, for Medicaid, both pediatric, and I'm presenting just the, the adult results. But I want you to take a look at this. We made a specific decision in this slide to pull out what we call SMS, Specialized Medicaid Services. They're typically social, t social type services that are not funded by other types of um, healthcare insurer products. Um, they include things like transportation, um, embedded healthcare workers in, in schools, um, home-based services, um, those, type, those types of services. And what we see is, is that the overall Medicaid spend here on traditional medical services is statistically significantly lower for those individuals who are involved in the practices. When we combine that with specialized Medicaid services, it blunts that curve a little bit, and this is why. What we have seen is, is that is an increase or a statistically higher amount of access to those social or special Medicaid services among the Medicaid population. So healthcare costs are going down while access to, to um, social services are, are steady or going up compared to comparison practices. Okay. So we're not at the end of our journey, and one of the other things that was mentioned to talk about was how does AC, how do ACOs come into the, into the play? For the Blueprint for Health preceded the ACA and preceded ACOs by years. Um, so we are evolving, and we're evolving in collaboration with our local ACOs. We, see, we saw the blueprint and the implementation of the ACOs as a transitionary step. And I'm putting this up because we are still in our journey. We haven't found the answers yet. And we're moving towards novel types of financing systems, um, potentially regional global budgets, those sorts of things. And they're important ingredients in the step. So what are we doing next in that transitionary phase? Um, we're creating unified community collaboratives. So we had communities work together. We had them design and develop their community health teams. We had them reorganize their community health services, but we never really established governance. So we're establishing governance in the communities to begin to look at data that's now newly available and say, well, what you've done quality improvement within organizations. Now we need to do quality improvement across organizations and are providing new types of support for that. We're also unifying our data collection with our ACOs. They report out for specific practices in a community. In Vermont, we have three ACOs, and any one community might have three ACOs represented it. But that divides our communities and their initiatives up. So what we said is let's create a unified um, data reporting so that we can present and prepare the data for the communities as a group so that they can do that performance improvement. We're increasing support. So that $2, our practice is now saying, is not sufficient to cover their costs for doing NCQA recognition. And our community health teams, we haven't increased. So we're, double, we're working on in our, this legislative session. Um, it's a nice to get out of Vermont during the legislative session, just to have a break. During this legislative session, doubling them. But we're also, if we double the PMPM payments, we're going to change the, the way that, that that design looks. And I'm going to skip forward a couple of slides um, so you can see what that looks like. So that's our data that we provide back to our communities. But looking at the time, I want to talk about kind of the direction we're going. We know that NCQA has made a difference in our state. We're beginning to look and see the data. There's lots of things coming out about that. It will continue to be a base. In addition, the participation on quality improvement projects related to the community's goals based on the community collaboratives are going to be essential for the primary care practice. So that's in the base. But we also know we're at a place where we need to pay for, begin to pay for performance. So it, as we double the payments, we're not just going to double them for NCQA recognition. But on top of them, we're going to put in a quality payment. And that quality payment will be on a composite of, of um, measures. We're gonna, we're, we've are going to we specifically decided to use the ACO measures because we don't want to drive people crazy working on 10 different things. Um, and utilization me and, and a utilization measure. We know that there's a direct correlation between utilization 
and the overall expense without an improvement in quality when we looked at it. So we're going to look at, at the health partners total utilization index. Now I want to point out something in this design. The bottom is based on the practices performance. The top two is based on the community's performance. So we're moving towards linking the payment for practices and payment um, to the overall performance of the communities. That brings the hospitals in. They own primary care practice. That brings in the FQHCs, and that brings in the independent primary care practices. And they're being joined by their community health team who is bringing in the partners, the health and, and human services partners into their community. So this is the transition that we're going through um, to get to our next wave. Important in that is the ability to provide data. We do have an all payers claims database where we've been able to provide claims data both at the community level and at the practice level. And now we've merged that with our health information exchange data so that we can, so this here is a claims based measure which is the PQI, it's a, a composite of hospitalization. But we can also put in clinical measures like hypertension. So this one there's not a lot of variance between communities but in some of our clinical measures there's significant variation. So we're able to hone in on that variation and help communities to decide what to work on. <coughs> Diabetes poor control, A1C is greater than nine, directly linked to um, folks' social support services and other things, actually also is a driver of cost and we do see more variation. So it's important to be able to provide that, that out to the communities and to give communities the opportunity to form governance. And that governance in our, our local unified community collaboratives includes not just the healthcare system, but the governance includes the mental health agency in a community, the area agency on aging, the home health agency, pediatrics, housing and housing organizations, tying them together in the, in the new payment model so that we can jump to um, a global budget. So that's kind of the direction that we're going. That defines it. I put some of those slides in more so that you would have them. Um, so really we're taking measurement, we're aligning that with incentives, we're providing the resources so that there's care coordination across health and human services agencies, and that we're hoping will drive towards our, our overall outcomes to um, hit the triple aim, reduce costs, um, improve health, and improve patient and provider experience. So. I've gone through a lot of information in 25 minutes. I know I couldn't describe the entire blueprint, so I skipped a lot. Um, but if you want more information, definitely check out our website, examples of the health service area or the community-based profiles um, that I skimmed through are there. In addition, um, I'm happy to answer questions. I'm sometimes a little slow to email, but I will do, do my best. Um, and our team, which are identified on our website, actually do an even better job uh, at, at answering questions. So um, you'll find their contact information on our website. So thanks for having me here. Wow, thank you so much. Both of you went through so much wonderful um, information and perspective. Uh, it's gonna be tough to uh, moderate a Q&A here that, to, that hits on all the right notes. I'm gonna try my best by kicking us off with a question or two. And then we have experts in the audience who I know are chomping at the bit, I'm sure, to, to uh, get their questions in. We have um, Jill Zorn in the corner over here and Lynn Eyed over here on my right. And they've got microphones. So when it comes time to um, ask, take questions from the audience, uh, uh, they'll come to you. And I'll need their help, actually, because it's a little dark looking out into the audience. But let me start. Thank you very much, both of you. Um, I, I think that you both, in both of your talks, really hit on three common themes. You both emphasize the importance of collaboration, the importance of aligning in, uh, the, the payment system to incentivize health and collaboration on health, mm -hmm. and you both um, emphasize measurement and really using data to know what you're doing and how to change it and how to make it better. Mm -hmm. So let's start with collaboration. Why is collaboration so important? Betsy? 
It's a great question. And I think you're absolutely right about the three key themes. I would fully agree. We both hit those, and I think they're critical. Why is collaboration so difficult? In fact, the way our environments have been structured, the financing, the how many patients can go where, different groups that have specialties can find themselves in competition with each other, can find that unless they can get their consciousness one level up to the full of the community, it's hard for them to see that the collaboration in the long term will pay back to them. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is a very hard thing for many different industries, but it's particularly difficult when you're talking about health because it takes a group effort. And in fact, if there's scarce resources, immediately providers are looking at, well, who gets that scarce resource? So I think it's quite natural. I would say that one thing that we have not, I think, studied enough, and I'll be so curious to hear how Vermont does this, but it's how do you get the governance that allows all the individual services to see one level up and see the whole. And I think different communities are doing it, but we haven't really studied it enough to know how to begin that process of getting that governance. So let's turn to the Vermont experience. You have the um, Unified Community Collaborative, and I, I see that there is essentially the blueprint lays out a statewide framework that is um, based on the NCQA standards. And then you let the local communities really be the, the uh, masters of their own destiny within that framework. So how well is that working? I imagine in some places better than others. How does collaboration, how does the governance structure get created that helps to support the outcomes you're looking for? Yeah, I think, um it's been an evolution over time. So I would say that we've transitioned from collaboration to, to now moving into governance. Um, and, and the collaboration was easier because the providers, the people who were providing care on the ground worked well together. It's been the governance, which is more at the leadership level, that's been a little more challenging to get in place. And I think what's driving that now is that the resources have been aligned around it. So. Um, the ACO resources in terms of a, a focus around community um, have, are aligned around the overall performance in a population, and that, that's changing the conversation. Um, <clears throat> and I think looking towards the fact that we know that we're looking towards a different financing system in Vermont, it may not be single payer, but there are, we're working towards a waiver um, to bring Medicare into, into the state in a different way. Mm -hmm. That it, knowing that that's coming has, even though we may not be investing some of those resources in some of our social service agencies yet, they realize that their funding is going to change. So they are beginning to partner in a, in a very different way. Smaller communities, more integrated communities had an easier time than our larger communities in making that collaboration and governance happen from the start. Um, but it's been a process. In the larger locations, was, was, has there been more competition? In the, in the larger locations, the best way I can describe it is the organizations are large enough that they are able to, um, if they see a gap, just make that service a part of their organization. Okay. Um, they haven't needed to depend on the other service providers in their, in their communities. And so they're building their empires. Um, is, is the best way, is, is my best description. We don't know anything about Connecticut, <laughs> actually. Um, and, and rather than, 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 than being reliant on, 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 their, on their community partners. So when, when um, you know, I, I was struck by uh, the comparisons to other countries, to the OECD countries, and, um, you know, the emphasis on collaboration. Uh, in other countries, you've got le legislation and regulation which sort of calls the shots. And, um, and so the, that and the alignment of the resources supporting uh, the, that integration, uh, we, we, don't ha we, we don't have that here. So we are looking to incentivize collaboration. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so you're, you're, you're saying essentially that it's really follow the money. And as long as collaboration is supported, right, mm -hmm. then there can be the standards set up and there can be the, the expectation and the requirement. Uh, I'm really um, uh, taken by the fact that the payers, the, the commercial payers, have agreed to participate in the per 
patient per monthly um, fee, which you admit it is low now. Um, where, where, so say a little bit more about that, bringing those players to the table. Okay. Um, so back as the blueprint was beginning to form, it actually formed out of the payers coming together and collaborating, saying what we needed to do differently. Mm -hmm. Now, we're a small market. We have three major commercial payers, um, one of which is an in-state payer and two, one of which is a regional and another is a national payer. Mm -hmm. They began to develop the concepts, the designs, and the ideas. But for a national payer, the market that we have in Vermont is so small, so selling to their board that model was very difficult. Mm. It actually ended up taking our legislature, taking the concepts and ideas that the payers were presenting and requiring that if you were going to participate in the market in Vermont, that you participate in the blueprint. Mm. So it, it, it was, it came out from c collaboration, but again, it ended up being our, legisla our legislation support. So it's required of the payers, and it's all willing providers, so it's voluntary on the provider side. Well, let me open this up to questions from um, the audience. Some of you in, uh, in the audience, uh, Lynn Garner here, that I, who I can see immediately. Hi, um, thanks very much, this is really great. My question is for Jenny. Um, I'm curious as to what degree people in Vermont um, are cognizant that there is this evolution of foot, that they are participants in this experiment, and, and what the kind of collective uh, opinion is about it. So, I think it depends on who you're talking about in, in Vermont. I, th I think to the average um, consumer of health and human services in a, in a community, it's in the background. They, they, it's, they don't see it. For providers of care in Vermont, it's right on the forefront. Um, they, they know that there, that there is this evolution. They know that they've gotten new resources. They know that they're doing care differently. And so um, they also have some level of fear about what the next wave of healthcare reform is going to look like. Um, and so to them, it's very transparent. How, how important has it been to have patient and you know, Vermont residents involved in the local design? I would say that's an area of growth um, for Vermont that we recognize that we need, but have not necessarily engaged as well as we could have. So we only have a couple of communities who have done justice to involving a consumer on their design board. Mm -hmm. Where they have, they've said it's incredibly invaluable because often they can identify processes or other things that mm -hmm. don't work from the consumer side sure. and make actually it more efficient for the healthcare mm -hmm. and human services systems if they, if they skipped those steps. But um, I don't think that we've had as big of an uptake as I would like to see it. And or, I don't count those communities who said, well, this person over here who kind of works within the healthcare system and understands, they can be our consumer. That, to me, isn't a, a genuine, mm -hmm. um, a genuine um, advocate. And, and that may apply on both the community services side as well as the healthcare delivery side, I'm, I it, imagine. It, I, I see them as a, as a continuum of services, yeah. and it definitely applies right. to, to both. To both. Mm -hmm. yeah. And other questions from the audience? I think we have one right here. Renee? Hi, um, I'm Renee Reese from the Connecticut Center for a New Economy, and I feel like our organization has grounded our work in the connection between health and sort of everything else, housing, good job, education, food, all these things. And so this is, this is a, a wonderful topic, a, an important topic. Um, and I have a question for Professor Bradley. When we think about the radical idea of creating um, more of a collaboration between social services and healthcare, I think about, I go right to one of the hardest places. You are, you are um, connected to, I mean, you're at Yale, so there's Yale New Haven Hospital, where the CEO earns more than $3 million, the commissioner of DSS running an equally complex you know, set of programs and organization makes, what, about a 30th of that, how are we gonna? How are we gonna do the important work of blending these cultures? And to add to the question, I think in my mind about um, someone I know who works 
for the Hartford Housing Authority repairing public housing. And he talks to me about the, the decrepit state of the public housing, right? And I think about the, I think about the fact that the resources, as you showed in your slides, go to healthcare and to the, you know, to the medical part of the equation. How can we go to that person and say, oh, now you're responsible for everybody being obese, but we're not, you don't have the resources, right? Mm. So, Yeah, great questions, thank you. I think this issue that you've raised, for me, identifies a core theme of what does inequality do to this ability to have collaboration? And even as Jenny described Vermont, the smaller places could get it to happen quicker. Probably those that are a little more homogeneous could get the collaboration. It was easier to trust. Now, you take the states where you have enormous inequality, and that could be inequality in terms of what people's salaries are, as you've identified, or it could be inequality in what the budget of the entire sector is, or it could be inequality in one community, that's a very wealthy community, right next to a poverty-stricken community. But when you look at the states that have very high inequality, um, I think that is where we have our core difficulty in being able to get the legislature and others to an individual leadership, all named, to sit down at the table and collaborate for a larger good. It's just very hard. If people were all had a medium income, they could sit together and really make something happen. But you get very wealthy and very poor. It's hard to sit together. They suddenly feel like us, them. In a lot of our work, looking at international things, which Francis had raised earlier, the countries that do tremendously well also score very high on the trust index. Mm. That is, do you trust your neighbor? Do you trust your town? Do you trust the next district over? Do you trust other countries? And they're very, very high in that. The United States is very low in that overall. If we look at ourselves internationally, our trust factor is quite low because we're so heterogeneous. And then you get in a state where there's enormous inequity in payment and everything else. It is hard to get people to see the light, which is why I was so interested in the governance question. How do we do what Jenny's state has been able to do in a place that's ridden with inequality? Do you change from within and the individuals that are part of that inequality really make the shift change? Or does it have to come from without when you see other states are able to get better health for the same expenditure? How have they done it? And it's sort of you get pressure from outside. So I, that's a little evasive from the specific Yale question, but I think it is, uh, it is nonetheless, I think, fair. <laughs> well, the, the, um, the, the issue of culture uh, and how business is done in different places is important. The map that you showed of, you know, um, uh, how much better I, it looks like uh, the, the, the West does in comparison to New England, there is a different culture there. And there's a, uh, there are cultural differences in the way that um, communities do problem solving. And I'm interested in the audience um, among some of the people that are participating in the panel after the break or others that are here from uh, communities in Connecticut that are working at the local level in collaboration, what your experience is sitting at a table with the senior VPs of the local hospital, the, the you know, area regional representative from the local, from the uh, national insurer, and, and uh, the academics and the, and the people serving, you know, providing services. I think we've acknowledged that um, uh, sometimes community-based services don't engage the people that they serve very well either. So is there any, any comment in the audience among anyone who's involved at the local level that can help shed light on how we go further? Yes, hello, doctor. Oh. I'm uh, from Middletown, Tennessee. Oh, just a moment. Let Jill get to you real quick. This is uh, the point about uh, coming together of stakeholders. Coming together of stakeholders, yes. that's right. Uh, for the common interest, and we have diverse population. Mm -hmm. uh, the biggest hospital is the Middlesex Hospital, and we have CVH and the River Valley Services, mm -hmm. and we have the Community Health Center, which has all these mobile clinics, wherever you are, that kind of treatment. And we have a group uh, called Community Benefit Group that meets in Middlesex, 
and its report is on the Middlesex thing. So we look at many aspects of the uh, problem, prevention, all of this. Plus we have CRT and all of those organizations we are very much engaged in. So in this collaborative manner, we can prevent duplication of services, mm -hmm. fragmentation of services, and the metrics are very important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In a psych central we found with young uh, people with uh, schizophrenia, for example, versus older, we were not doing that well. Mm -hmm. And we realized there was a, g a breakdown between what the River Valley services people were doing and we were doing. And so as the need occurred, we had the case managers from River Valley come into our mm -hmm. uh, treatment planning. So this, that's at the patient level. Mm -hmm. And the systemic level, the president of um, Middlesex, uh, uh, Helen Vartez, the CEO of uh, CVH, and uh, Mark Maselli and Margaret Flinter, we were all uh, in agreement about who takes ownership of the patient under different levels of intensity. And uh, that has worked quite well, but we still have one problem with the ACO. It is when you uh, look at expenses, like in Camden, New Jersey, are we cherry-picking patients? Are we dumping our difficult patients on mm -hmm. somebody else's threshold? Mm -hmm. right to cut our expenses, and are we jacking up utilization rates for increasing our profit? So we so, still need to deal with that. So Jenny, is that something you're encountering in Vermont? In the sense of? Cherry picking. Cherry picking. And sort of more, you know, the, high, the super users and the more complex cases being dumped. 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 So I, no. It, uh, How are you preventing it? So I, a couple of things I think th that's unique to Vermont, and that mm -hmm. is that it's, the blueprint is a statewide initiative. Each of the ACOs are statewide, but they represent instead a different type of provider. And uh, this is going to be a vast overall generalization, but our largest ACO represents the, all of the hospitals and the hospital-owned practices with a sprinkling mm -hmm. um, of independent practices. Our other ACO in Vermont is the um, Community Health Accountable Cares for the FQHCs and the third are the independents. So what they really did was identify the ACOs themselves are provider groups. We've given specific um, thought to having those three ACOs work together so that we're capitalizing on what I'm gonna call both the vertical infrastructure of the ACOs and the horizontal infrastructure of the communities. Any one of our communities could have been divided among those three ACOs and they all realize it, uh -huh. um, all the ACOs do, but yet to achieve the outcomes, they realize they're gonna need to have the communities. We, the blueprint spent a significant amount of time in helping the ACOs come to understand that by dividing th what they were gonna do is not be able to achieve the same out achieve outcomes. It's one hospital, per health service area. It's one designated mental health agency, one home health agency. Mm -hmm. And so by dividing by vertical infrastructure, that wasn't going to be helpful. So instead, we're capitalizing on that. Mm -hmm. We're using the vertical infrastructures to help infuse resources like the community health teams, mm -hmm. like quality improvement practice facilitators or community facilitators into the local communities. And we're still using the vert vertical infrastructure with data and other things to help um, help the community design. And I think that goes to your, your comment about inequities. Mm -hmm. When we began to try to force um, decisions down from a state level to communities in, in some projects that I've worked on, um, those communities pushed back because of inequities. When we allowed the communities to work together and define and decide what they were doing, it, mm. it made a, a huge difference. Yep. Um, so that I think that answers your question. It certainly does. And I, I think it also reinforces the importance of systemic planning and design, yes. and really um, having an infrastructure that is statewide, that is led by government, but flexible enough to allow local areas to define their own right. strategies, but to protect against the perversities that could otherwise exist. Yeah. Is that fair? It is fair. And what I'd like to add to that, it was a very conscious decision, and, and not a popular decision at the time, to change the framework of what the what the state was going to do. And I, I don't think all, st all state government is set up to do this yet. And that is that we began to look at ourselves and our role as providing resources and support versus providing expertise and direction. Hmm. So again, we're providing resources and support and allowing 
the direction to come up from the local local communities. Now, that sometimes looks like us going out and doing research on best practices, mm -hmm. but that involves the communities and their voice. So when we designed our opiate treatment um, project that is statewide that puts, in addition to the community health teams, nurses and care coordinators for mm -hmm. um, individuals who are getting opiate treatment, we went to the communities and said, what is it that you need first? and then designed from that framework. So again, mm -hmm. we're, su we're supporting the local communities versus telling the local communities what to do. I'd like to make a comment on this. I think that is very, very important. And I'm also um, cognizant, having traveled a lot in other countries as well in the US to look at different models. I, I think we're not going to find a model that is, okay, you just need to get a state that has this role mm -hmm. and they understand. As you said so well, it has to be tailored to the culture of that exactly. state. And our states are so different. Sometimes it's the county level. Sometimes it's the city level. Sometimes it's a private industry in an area that's going to germinate these very interesting collaborations. Mm -hmm. And I think if it's one thing, while we don't have a lot of trust because we're diverse, I think one thing that the United States does have is enormous ingenuity and innovation and flexibility to try different things. And in some parts of the country, it's just not going to fly that the government coordinates everything. But in fact, the private sector may in some places actually demonstrate some tremendous leadership. So Elizabeth, you, you live in Connecticut. You're, you're in um, a, a preeminent university uh, in the backyard of a preeminent medical academic medical center. What do you think is the prospect for Connecticut on this front? <laughs> who, who is going to be who is going to be your key leader? Because leadership is important. Where is my media trainer? <laughs> <laughs> Repeat the question. What? <laughs> uh, you can so answer I, that any way you can. No, no, no. I, I have an answer for you. I tend to be an optimist, uh -huh. and. Uh, so I think the prospects are very good. I think that we have tremendous pressure from the outside. So that's one thing. If we were just left to our own, maybe I wouldn't have as much trust. But we have Vermont to compete with. We have New York. <laughs> we have New York City doing unbelievable things in a very diverse setting. Mm. So when I get discouraged about places where we have huge disparities, or we don't have the data, or we have thousands of payers that are changing constantly, I do hearken back to some areas in which amazing things in health have changed. Think about 40 years ago where this whole place would be filled with smoke because we would all be smoking. And wherever we go to eat, there'd be cigarettes everywhere. Today, we just don't do that. Mm -hmm. It's completely a different world about tobacco use. And tobacco was one of the largest industries that had everybody captured. I mean, that was a tough thing to do. It took 40 years. But if we could do that, I think in Connecticut we have a lot of resources. And the pressure from the outside, I think, will come together. Some of the great states that are showing the way, I think Connecticut will find a way to definitely improve where we are. It's not sustainable the way it is now. And um, so I tend to be optimistic. So you feel optimistic. I do. Let's get, take another couple of questions. I think we just have about enough time for two questions. Um, I'm having a little trouble seeing here. How about here, Judith? Hi, it's terrific. I wanted to ask each of you if you could just comment on the role of pediatrics and children's health. Um, mm -hmm. You kind of alluded to it, but the data you showed, I think, is largely for the adult population. And we know there are a lot of challenges in terms of the uh, ability to save money, the, effect, the efficiency when you're doing preventive work with uh, children. So could you just comment on how that's happening both in Vermont and in terms of your data, Elizabeth? Thank you. Sure. I can talk a little bit from the data point of view. Uh, the data on being able to do zero to six, zero to five well is unequivocal. We see all this chronic illness emerging and Lancet series, New England Journal of Medicine, people are really starting to publish great data on. It has to do with even those first three years start the path towards chronic illness or not. So from my perspective, what we invest in children and early childhood, both health and development, 
because those have been separated a bit in the literature, the health piece, and then the education and psychology and development piece, they're sort of not put together as well as they could be in the literature. But from a lay perspective, that early childhood piece is the best investment we could make. And a lot of the social services that have supported women and children have been shown to be very cost effective in their offsets um, for health spending. So. I'm a big believer in it. I would love to hear what the actual practical application of using pediatrics in the community health teams and in Vermont mm -hmm. has been. And yeah, so um, pediatrics is, an, I, I did only show adult slides today, but um, our pediatric slides are similar in terms of overall healthcare costs coming down. Mm -hmm. um, we, it, just as our family practice and internal medicine practices come in, our pediatric practices come in. They become recognized as patient-centered medical homes. They work on slightly different things. So instead of a chronic condition, they work on ensuring that all children have well-child um, exams on a regular basis, immunizations, developmental screening. Um, so they're really inherently involved in the process of improving care and then also connections to community services. But for many of our, our children who are our highest utilizers, there's a lot of services. They're children with special health needs. Our community health team tends to be focusing more on children that may have issues further into the future. So um, there's an issue with a parent who has depression mm -hmm. and trying to get the parent into treatment. There's um, an issue with a child who is overweight and showing signs of obesity. So trying to get them and their families into nutrition counseling earlier. Asthma. So the asthma. That's been um, very successful. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Doing, you know, what can we do by going into the homes of children who have asthma and looking around and seeing if there's home-based issues. Mm -hmm. So. I, although the interventions have been tailored for pediatrics, they are an important component of our community health team. And in fact, when I talked about the payments and the way we're hoping the payments will change, two, two of our four measures that we have identified within that relate directly to pediatrics. So one of the, two of them will be adult measures, and then two of them are pediatric measures, um, adolescent um, adolescent well-child visits because we, we always picked measures that we thought, felt like we could improve on and developmental screening for children zero to three. Mm -hmm. so. Time for one more question. Uh, I have three people right over here next to each other. <laughs> Gen the gentleman with <coughs> hand up. Yeah, thank you very much. Randy Trowbridge. I'm a physiatrist from Danbury, Connecticut. Um, for those who don't know about physiatry, it's all about whole body functional analysis. So when I'm looking at things, everything in life is all about integration and function and totality. And so uh, what was presented today, fantastic information, guidance, structure. It almost made me think of some of those PowerPoint presentations where things are floating. I like your PowerPoint uh, pr presentations okay. because when these are floating around and they're zooming across the screen, it distracts. Uh, and I, I also think that that's the way we're, where we are with healthcare. There's almost like all this stuff floating around. And, Pretty soon it's just going to come together and just hit, and we're all going to see what it really should be. It's going to come into focus? <laughs> it's going to come into focus, exactly. Uh, here's, the, here's the key thing. Health, as you, as you mentioned, Dr. Bradley, health is not hard to figure out. Our biggest problem is, like you said, it's governance. Mm -hmm. I'll say to my patients, I know how to get you better, and 90% of my patients, we get better. I said 98% we can probably get better if I can execute the plan to get them better. Mm -hmm. And the problem lies in the inability to get from here to there. Mm -hmm. That's our biggest problem. So empowering people, getting all the patients together, getting the legislators to understand this is what we want in our state is probably the biggest obstacle. That along with, along with the one thing, which on one slide in the, in the uh, this expenditures I saw was 6% for education. And whatever that means in terms of numbers, I don't know. Uh, I'm not thinking about trying to find a model around the world that we want to adopt. Why don't we create our own model that works better than any model around the world? And so 6% for education, what I find is that's the biggest problem that we have mm -hmm. is not educating the community. And what I mean by that is, okay, everybody's sitting in this room and our minds are thinking about everything that's going on. Our bodies right now are taking care of us. They know exactly what needs to be done. We know in science what needs to be done. When, they, when we've done studies to find out do patients understand their, the nature of their condition? Do they understand what they have control over? Mm -hmm. We're not empowering individuals. That if we're looking at 60%, 70%, 80% of what's affecting us, okay, is in our control, mm -hmm. how do we actually empower? This has been studied and published, so why aren't we 
spending a lot of money saying, let's get into the communities, into the school systems, and change them so that we get people understanding that, you know, I have control over my health. Okay. I don't see it happening, even with my patients. Just so you know that, I see my patients, young and old, when they come in, I didn't realize I could. I'm very didn't. interested in that point, and I want to connect it to the community health worker because I think that um, we all, this issue comes up at every single one of the forums and in every environment where we talk about um, how do we do better. So the emphasis on health and prevention and empowering ourselves to take better care of our own health, knowledge where it's needed, but also the supports. Talk about what's happening in Vermont, what the role of the community health worker is, and um, let's see if, if you can reflect on what you've learned about what other countries are doing in that arena. And I think that we're going to have to close after that. But uh, Jenny, please. Um, I think it, it, that's such a, we could spend An hours. Hour. Um, it's I a multi-dimensional. Multi so um, we've been very specific at providing providing peer support programs. So our self-management programs are all, almost all peer-led. Mm -hmm. um, and so there are six of them. That's been an important component. We've also worked within our primary care practices to better understand shared decision-making and self-management support um, and um, really have integrated those that type of planning, so self-management goals mm. versus just clinical goals mm -hmm. into the care that's being provided both in health and human services organizations. Are we there yet? No, that's, but, but those two things alone have had a significant impact in the Is state. the data showing you're starting to get some traction? Yeah, we one of the things, I mean, we look at our overall outcomes, and I would, our overall outcomes are, are positive. In the right direction. Versus just our specific component by component. I would say that in Vermont, the investments in the community health teams, the self-management programs, the primary care practices, and those community um, resources and interventions as a package have made the difference, not any one of them alone. Yeah, very important. Well, I'm going to have to echo that exact theme, and it ties to what your profession is. We think, well, just empower the patient, and they'll figure out with their families and their social network how to maintain health with all the resources that are there. But that's not just a just. That's really hard. And uh, I think it actually takes all of us, just as I was saying about the demand and the supply piece of this. And we have so many pieces of it that are a little misaligned right now. Um, we, we have a medical care system that is, not, is pretty incentivized to keep people on the medicine and keep people turning towards medical care. We have a population that doesn't have that much trust in the government generally. The government could put things together, but if you look at our political history, you know, everybody in the United States is descended from somebody who left an oppressive government at one point or another, <laughs> at some time in their history. There's a myth back there. So those just add to the complexity of us being able to see the whole. So I think we will get there, but there will have to be pressure and pain along the way to be able to get there. And your own profession, I think, can demonstrate tremendous leadership in it, just as what it believes. So thank you for the question. Well, I'm sorry we have to close because we could probably go another hour very easily. But I want to um, thank you both for really um, thought-provoking ideas and clearly the intersection of bringing all the right players to the table, a very inclusive table, the al aligning the resources to support and incentivize the right kind of uh, approach to this, sustained and systematic integrated work, and measuring along the way and setting metrics. Mm -hmm. five, five metrics, the way to Wellville, I don't know if mm -hmm. folks are familiar with that, but the idea that a community can say, okay, we're gonna improve these five metrics. That is very, very empowering. And uh, thank you very much. And the con conversation is going to continue. Uh, we're going to take a brief uh, break, 15 minutes, and then come back here. And we will assemble our own Connecticut warriors on the front uh, to, to talk with us about what's happening. Uh, some of the examples like um, we heard about Middletown uh, in other places as well.